And I wrote a book a few years ago uh, before I did my books on the re religion and the rebellions. Uh, it focused on the 1840s, the immediate post-rebellion period, which is a very important period because the rebellion, I mean, the, uh, the deadlock, the political deadlock leading up to the rebellions in both upper and lower Canada was um, holding back what we would call uh, reform. This idea of state formation, uh, particularly associated with Bruce Curtis, and but he's picked it up from you know English historians, sociologists, is the idea that the state uh, becomes increasingly involved at the local level in, in in daily lives, almost the way it is today, where we regulate you know where you can smoke and so on and so forth. Before the 1840s, the state was a very distant. Um, uh, distant sort of force or whatever you want to call it um, and uh, you didn't have much in the way of local government you just had the colonial government off in you know Toronto or, or Quebec City um, and once the uh, the deadlock between the reformers and the Tories was broken by the rebellions and upper and lower Canada were, were joined and you began to have re move towards responsible government uh, which gave more powers to the Legislative Assembly. Uh, then they were able to bring in reforms that created a state-supported school system uh, funded by local uh, taxes and brought in a municipal system, local governing council system, uh, which was fundamental to building you know, infrastructure, particularly roads, improving the transportation network, but also subsidized the railways, which would start to be built in the late 1840s because you could tax local municipalities uh, to bring the railway through their, through their township or whatever. Um, that liberal historians have seen that as a progressive step, right, towards modernization of the economy because well, first of all, you know, education becomes something that's more widespread. People are becoming literate and uh, and therefore able to participate sort of in the new economy and in politics uh, more knowledgeably. Um, but uh, the more radical view of state formation theorists is that this is all uh, kind of a... Uh, a move towards increasing control over people's lives, that the state is somehow uh, an entity into itself which uh, takes on a life of its own. Um, and I've, I'm not a supporter of that primarily because I find it frustratingly difficult to identify what the state is. It's some kind of, is it some kind of force or who is behind it? Um, the older view might have been that the state is dominated by the bourgeoisie or whatever, and, and it certainly is. But you know, in my point of view, when, when you get local government, at least at the local level, it's not the bourgeoisie from Quebec City or Montreal or Toronto that's controlling it, all of it. Because just as we're having elections this week, uh, there are certain things that uh, are, you know, local governments may not be all that powerful, but what they do has more direct impact on people's lives often than what distant provincial or colonial governments do. And uh, why were people given the right to vote for these things? Well, uh, and they initially, my book actually in the 1840s is a, is a history, if you look at the municipal system, of how it starts off being quite centralized uh, because they didn't really trust local people uh, to vote. Uh, um, knowledgeably or responsibly, but they resisted that. They would not pay taxes to a system that they didn't see the immediate benefits from. So eventually it becomes localized, uh, particularly in Lower Canada, which I can speak of more knowledgeably, to the township level. And, um, and then townships kind of co coalesce to create counties, so you've got a two-level local system. But once you get it to the township level and people see that the taxes that they're paying are going to roads that run by their door that will allow them to get their farm goods off to a market somewhere, then they're willing to pay for it. And I actually argue by looking at hundreds of petitions from the townships that the local people were pushing this, that it is not something imposed from the top. It might have been the local notables, as we call them, who are behind it, you know, but 
I don't think they were forcing these people to sign these petitions. It was in their own self-interest that this would happen because the townships in particular, eastern townships in particular, are cut off from major river arteries. They depend upon roads and so on. Prior to the railway era, prior to the era in which they had you know, major leading roads, the only way they could get anything to market was in the wintertime uh, via sleighs. And so you had to, all you could sell was very low bulk produce. So they sold a lot of potash, they sold potato whiskey, um, and uh, well, that, those are two of the major products that they could actually uh, get to an external market. So they were very keen on seeing uh, local self-government. After all, they come from New England originally, where the town system of government is fundamental to the whole American governing system. But they weren't, and they tried to introduce it when they first move into the Lower Canada and the government steps, steps on, down on it and ref, forbids it because they saw it as one of the causes of the American Revolution, too much local self-government. Well, Durham comes along and he says, not having local self-government is one of the causes of the rebellion because people, you need uh, local government, municipal government as a kind of a training ground uh, for people to vote responsibly at the, at the, at the provincial level because it, when they see that their vote actually has a direct impact on them, then they will become more responsible when they vote. Um, so he flipped it completely around, and it's because of him that when his, he was followed by Sydenham as the next governor, Sydenham brings in municipal government. And, um, and, and I think the, the education system parallels in a way because the school councils were given um, the authority to raise taxes. And in fact, they had to raise taxes or they would not get a grant from the central government. So they were, if they raised 50%, the central government would give them an equivalent. So it was kind of a carrot rather than a stick approach. And uh, the result in Lower Canada was fairly phenomenal because you had almost, among the habitat, among the last, vast majority of the population were illiterate uh, up until 1840. Once the school system is uh, uh, is uh, the state moves in and creates a, a, a locally supported school system in which they actually begin to, you know, uh, dictate the curriculum to a certain extent, uh, expect teachers to have certain kinds of qualifications and so on. You have a rapid rise in literacy. That isn't to, to say that it was all, you know, light in a sense because the Catholic Church manages to maintain a lot of control over the school system. It doesn't completely control it like everybody seems to think. Uh, certainly the state, uh, you know, there was a ministry or a superintendent of education had a lot of influence. But the Catholic Church does control textbooks to a certain extent. And a lot of them become teachers because nuns in particular were very inexpensive to hire. And so as the 19th century progresses, what you see is uh, in English Canada, you see more and more women being hired, young women, because they can pay them less. In French Canada, it's, it's women as well, but many of them in religious orders uh, who didn't need a living wage, really. Uh, so that's another way that the church was able to mean a lot of, uh, maintain control over the education system, basically up till 1960 in many respects.